of the NPP, Nana Obibuahin, who we had on the program earlier in the week. Uh, he spoke on right here on Spotlight on MX24 television. But before we listen and take a recap of what he said, let's listen to what former president said exactly. The only country we have, we must therefore work hard and do all we can to protect it from abuse from whichever quarters that may come. Ladies and gentlemen, this government, the NPP government, has completely lost control of the fight against corruption. <laughs> President Akufuado, in his inaugural address, promised to protect the public purse. Today, even that public purse cannot be found. The revelations in the Auditor General's report for 2021 is simply a microcosm of the real extent of the seeming institutionalization of corruption under this administration. I'm glad that you're using this festival to draw attention to this important national issue that requires the support of all citizens to address. The economic hardship in Ghana today is unbearable. Cost of living has increased significantly because of rising inflation. Prices are changing in the market every day, and this makes it very difficult for the ordinary Ghanaian to survive. Uh, that was former President John Dramani Mahama. These are the comments uh, that have resulted in many, many responses. Now, here is the reaction of former uh, Secretary, General Secretary of the NPP, Nana Ubri Boahin. You see, I'm very sure that he who comes to equity is quite ridiculous. You see, I'm very sure that he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. Mm. And he who wants to go to the shrine of equity must be prepared to do what is equitable. Mm. Now, you see, you need to examine the structures, the institutions. Obama said it. So look, it's not a question of uh, availability of strong men. But we need to strengthen the institutions, the structures. You have a government that has established the office of special prosecutor. You never had that on 19, 7th January 1993. You have a government for the first time in the history of this country that has provided enough and fantastic support to strike the UCO, national investigations, and other institutions. So that is also clear in the case that this government or the NPP government is bent on supporting the fight against corruption. Look, let's even look at the digitization and the digitalization system. Now, from the Auditor General's report, you can realize that some individuals who are no longer alive, but so they are being paid, or pay, monthly payments are being received in their needs. But with the implementation of this digitalization, you realize that some needs are being cleared from the system. I agree that as a country, it will take us some time, but I can assure you from the bottom of my heart that this is a government that has put in place adequate provision to ensure that the fight against corruption is as well <laughs> or well considered. Honorable, honorable, no, please. As for, um, the, as for the former to president, I always play to the gallery. I mean, we don't need to. We don't need to. We do respect the wasting our time on some of these comments. Look, here is a man who I heard him reading sentiments about the Article 71, mm. the payment of El Russia, but. You, I have it on authority. I have it authority that former president has received no less than 12 billion Ghana cities. That was Nana Obri Boahin uh, reacting to the comments by former president John Dramani Mahama. Uh, let me just come back in studio. Uh, let's get into this discussion. Um, Justice, beginning with, with you. Now, considering the trend of corrupt related activities, that we have seen in both administrations. It, is any of them qualified to bring up this conversation? Is any of them holier than the other? 
Uh, good evening uh, again, yes. Okay, so for me, one of the things I do in journalism is to hold, you see, the duty bearer, the current duty bearer to account. Mm -hmm. Especially to when the current duty bearer is saying that my predecessor was equally corrupt. Then I said, okay, if he was equally corrupt, bring him to book because you wield the hand mm -hmm. of state, the power of state, all the coercive forces of the state, all the judicial, everything are at your disposal. So if your predecessor was equally corrupt, mm. bring him to hook. That is my attitude towards these things. And so for me, it is not about who qualifies to talk about corruption. But increasingly, the Auditor General comes out with reports that suggest that either our uh, gatekeepers have been sleeping on the job or whatever, I cannot tell. And billions of Ghana cities have been stolen daily. We sit down here and a country comes to give us a grant of $3 million, $1.5 million, and then we take it, we organize a program and we receive that grant and we make it news, we make news out of it. Then we sit down, then billions of Ghana cities are being stolen by public officials and their associates. So for me, it is not about whether somebody qualifies to say you are corrupt or not, but the fact is that there is a present danger mm. that even if, we, even if we do not deal with this problem, the $3 billion we are looking for from IMF, it may come and then at the end of the day, Ghana's situation will be worse because we may not find what the money has been used for, yet we will be indebted and we need to find money to service that loan and then repay it in future. This is my concern. Mm, mm, mm. Interesting, Justice. So uh, you are charging uh, the, the present administration. I mean, if your predecessor was corrupt then bring them to book uh so yeah. we we are hoping to see a bit more of that um let me let me just go to asante Otri quickly we, we had nano briboahe say that uh, he, he who wants to go to the shrine of equity must be prepared to be equitable we've heard the comments of former president john dramani mahama uh he's saying that this administration has lost the fight against corruption. Um, this is an administration that promised the office of the special prosecutor. In fact, we have seen that office being uh, operational. Does this move not qualify to absolve them of any allegations of corruption? Well, uh, let me say good evening to our viewers. Um, I think we need to put the conversation in its proper perspective um, and proper context. I think where the ex-president is coming from, or former president is coming from, is uh, after the Auditor General's report for 2021 that came out, and uh, mm -hmm. apparently we are moving from bad to worse. And that's the more reason why he came out with that particular statement that we are going to protect the public purse. It appears the purse, you know, has gone ill or it's gotten missing. Because if you look at the trend from 2017, we saw a certain amount of uh, what we call misapplication, you know, uh, irregularities and so on and so forth, losing such billions of cities. Now, 2018, we saw a reduction, and that was, I think, around 3 point something billion. Uh, 2019, then it increased again, a little over 5 billion. 
2020, we saw a dramatic, you know, rise in terms of these kinds of losses. 12, a little over 12 billion. Now the situation is not getting better with the presence of the OSB, with the presence of the Attorney General. We have situations where we are talking about surcharging, disallowancing, all these have been put in place to ensure that the state does not hemorrhage. What do we see? So a nation that is going for an IMF program, which we are likely to get $3 billion, so to speak, for a certain number of years, can sit and look on as we lose $17.4 in a particular financial year. What else will you expect anybody to say? This is not about equalization. Besides, if you consider in terms of corruption, the two political parties as they have ruled, of course, they will be using Mr. Mahama as the yastic, and President Akufadu will equally be the president. If you look at the corruption index that has come over the period that he has been in power, the lowest of Mr. Mahama is his highest. So in as much as corruption has been in both you know, government, which is a human institution, there is no way you, know, you will have a particular financial year that corruption will not you know, rear its ugly head in any of the government, uh, in any of the structures of government. But if you do the comparative analysis, the figures do not add up when it comes to President Akufuado's era. It is quite bizarre because I sit down and ask myself, the president can even do a simple arithmetic calculation. If at the end of the day, your debt to GDP ratio is rising so fast, and yet you are borrowing so much, which obviously should have been in some kind of capex or investment so that to be yielding something. What tells you, what, what that tells you is that a significant chunk of that particular money that has been trickling down into the system goes into corruption. This is simple. And you don't need any atmospheric scientist to do such a simple you know, calculation. That apart, if you listen to, if you have followed all these Afrobarometers that have come, corruption index, the CDDs, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, global informatics, all these information that have come out indicate that Ghanaians do not have any confidence in the NPP in fighting corruption. They do not have any confidence in the president now or in the future. That is what the report said, that he does not have what it takes to fight corruption. And that is the more reason why the figures that we are seeing year in, year out is what? It's like eggs that have splashed on the face of our president and the, and the leaders of this country. So, I mean, if you want to attack the ex-president, probably because you are trying to do equalization, but what he has said on record and what the data says, it is clear that we have lost the plot. Our current president is not in any form or shape to fight corruption. We have had a litany of cases that have gone, what, uninvestigated. Uninvestigated, probably, unless we have a change of government, that is when we may be able to go into that. But that is the more reason why probably Mr. Mahama's, you know, percentage has always been higher. And his lowest is their highest. Because if he was able to prosecute his own, which we are yet to see in our current government, then it is a problem you know, for all of us. And it is no longer mere rhetoric. We need to see action. We need to see that the prosecution as we are having now, you know, goes further into the cases that, you know, affect the very members, you know, of the current government. But that is, that is not really the case. All what we have been doing is to be chasing after the others. When in actual fact, you could see that some of these things could easily be some kind of trump up, you know, charges of cases. But Let's see how it goes. But as I'm telling you now, the figures, the data as we have now, do not in any way support the cause or the case of our current president. 
and esteem. It is a worse and a bizarre situation that we find ourselves. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Autry, let me just quickly find out uh, from Justice before we move on to the next topic. Uh, Justice, when, when we look at both uh, administrations over time, are we able to say that there's been enough commitment to fighting corruption from both ends? All right. So, um, like Autry said, um, um, good evening, Autry. Um, at least in the era of John Mahama, you found Abuga Pele. Abuga Pele was a deputy minister for youth and sports under Jerry Rollins and was a member of parliament for Chianapaga, a two-time member of parliament for Chianapaga on the NDC ticket. But then he was indicted under Mahama and Mahama allowed prosecution to go on. Such a high profile personality in his party, the prosecution went on, and I think it was under this government that the case was closed and he was jailed. So at least you have that. And then you also have this um, Ghana Anti-Corruption Initiative um, that was launched under him. And I attended that launching. And they put that whole Ghana Anti-Corruption Initiative together. And I, so he showed the a semblance of willingness to fight corruption. We saw also under him a number of things when the bus branding case happened, um, the public outcry made them pull back. Yes, it could be an attempt to steal the money, which I will not hold brief for anybody. But when the public cried out, they pulled back and did something to cut down on the cost. A number of things. So you may say that um, there was this semblance of willingness under him um, to fight corruption and prevent the looting of the public purse. Um, did he do enough? Nobody ever does enough because we will not want a penny of Ghana, um, the taxpayers' money to be stolen. So we will not say he did enough. But when you compare as um, Ochi rightly said, the Afrobarometer reports that come, when you compare them, uh, uh, the Ghana Integrity Initiative, yes, when they did um, their corruption index, perception index, you realize that then Mahama's time, the situation was better than we are seeing today because Ghana keeps, you know, falling on that particular index, which does not speak well of our country, it does not actually paint a good picture of us to the, you know, the international yeah. community, the global community, the people we go to to look for grants, uh, the international capital market where we go to look for, you know, capital for our projects. But they realize that uh, when the money comes, what do we use it for? We allow it to be stolen. So it doesn't speak well of that. So yes, you would like to do a comparison. But for me, as I keep saying, politicians, you know, have, as we see in Ghana, they all have a similar interest. They first of all want to feed first before they give the public their fingers to lick. And so I would not like to be doing the comparisons, mm. though current uh -huh. situations compel you do a comparison between the two. Right. Uh, th thank you, Justice. I, uh, if you could just readjust your, your, your video. We have so much headroom uh, up there, and I think you're way at the bottom of the screen. If you could just uh, adjust that uh, briefly. Let me go to Lordia. I hope you can hear me, Lordia. I hope that you are uh, on the line. Uh, the, the last question on this particular issue, I mean, I don't know which side of the fence you're sitting on, but there's also been the argument that it's the kind of politics we practice in this country that contributes to so much uh, corruption. How can we mitigate this? Okay, so on this corruption issue, uh, I believe that everybody have a part to play. Now, the problem with us is that when um, a party is not in power, 
they see all the wrongs. They will talk about all the issues that are in the system. So when I come to power, I'll be able to fight corruption. They give us all the promises. Unfortunately, the moment they come to power, it doesn't happen. And this is something that all our governments have been doing over time. I think it is important that the things we see when we are not in power, when we come to power, we should be able to fight it now. Uh, I believe uh, the former government did what they could do, or they tried doing what they think they can do. The present government is also claiming that they are also doing their best. So the question is, where is the problem coming from? Mm. And two, is it enough that when you are in power, you keep blaming or comparing yourself to your predecessor? Right. Uh... Laudia, I think we're losing your line there, but we're just going to try to stabilize it. Um, if, if you're just joining us and you're listening, we are taking a rundown of the stories of the week. Uh, we just started with corruption comments that were made by former President uh, John Romani Mahama on the back of the Auditor General's report for 2021, um, merging into other issues, of course. Uh, we're just talking to Laudia to, to explain... Uh, how the kind of politics that we practice in this country contributes to the menace. Uh, but we're having issues with her line there. I'm just going to move on to this entire ex Gracia uh, saga, which has been uh, all over the news this week. We witnessed so many debates over the payment of uh, ex Gracia, as stipulated by Article 71 of the 1992 Constitution. Former President Mahama had indicated is resolved to address the provision of the constitution which he believes is draining the finances of the country uh, but a member of the NPP Kwame Abronye has questioned the commitment of the former president to carry out his promise now we also know the Bono East chairman of the NPP claims Mr. Mahama has already bagged 14 million Ghana cities in ex Croatia this is a claim that has generated heated debate after uh, the former president denied it um, in an interview. Let's watch what the former president said. When a traditional ruler and a former member of the Council of State returns a gratuity that was paid to him because he thinks it was not necessary and he didn't deserve to have that money paid to him, he should receive acknowledgments and gratitude and not insults. Togbi, you are a man of principle, you are a man of conviction. And we all admire you for that. And so don't change, just continue being yourself. As I said recently, I want to assure all Ghanaians that the next NDC administration, as I have recently said, will revisit the, uh, the matter of Article 71 emoluments, especially the issue of ex gratia payments and the size of government, to cut down on expenditure as a way of protecting our scarce resources. Let me just start with Laudia. That's if she's back on the line. Laudia, do we have you back? Okay, uh, let me go to Justice there while, while we try to catch uh, Laudia. Justice, what do you make of this back and forth uh, argument? It appears we can't seem to tell uh, who, who's been truthful, who's not been truthful. Or are we just playing the usual political games that we play in this country? Hmm. Right, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much again. Um, you see, the issue of ex gratia, when you look at it, the quantum of money that is given to people who have come to serve the country, they claim they have come to serve the country for four years, for eight years, and the quantum of money given to them as S. Gracia. And then you want to compare that with a teacher, a nurse, a civil servant who served this country for 25 years, and for a particular reason, the fellow needed to retire five years before time. And then he, he saw her take home pay. It's just about 3,000, 5,000 CDs. 
the maximum is 14,000 cities. But somebody comes to parliament, somebody comes to serve in the office of the president, and a huge chunk of money is you know, doled out to them as S. Gratia now. So you realize that the political class, the ruling class, are creating you know, a system, a, a class system, where the ruling class eat the juicy portion of whatever the national cake is, and then the rest of us can go to hell for all they care. Because, for instance, somebody who comes to parliament and is not leaving tomorrow, only one term of parliament has ended, and the fellow is going to seek re-election. Why do you pay ex gratia to such a person? Or when a president does only one term and has won to go into the next term, or maybe didn't win but wants to come back, why do you pay ex gratia to such a fellow? They have indicated that they haven't ended their political career, their service to the nation. I thought that the ex gratia will be given to them when they are going home finally and they, they, they are no more coming to serve in the public office. And then the quantum of money is immoral. It's too much because, you see, when you consider the kind of, the, 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 the kind of money doled out to them, and then you consider our economic circumstances, we go out there cap in hand, begging for, you know, uh, uh, how do you call it? Money is as low as $10 million from donors to do our things. And yet we spend huge sums of money on this Article 71 office holders. Then you realize that this whole country needs a thorough, a thorough discussion on this issue of uh, 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 ex gratia. And then we bring, because you see, my problem is that after General Rawlings left office, the issue of S. Gratia was discussed in this country. And then it was made to be, to look as if it was the generalist and his people who were so greedy. Then President Kufo also leaves office. Then this whole discussion came back. Mahama leaves office, the discussion comes back. And President Kufo may be leaving office and then this whole issue will come back. And so every time we discuss it, we do not find a concrete solution to it. We do not make any emphatic decisions about it. And so then the politicians begin to go away and then they are taking. So I think that it is also one of the things that create the corruption in the public service. Because the public servants are seeing that, hey, we are here every day doing the work, but the politicians come for four years, eight years, and they are given this huge sums of money, which we do not get even when we go on retirement. So that kind of thing becomes an incentive for the public servants to also loot the state coffers through dubious deals that they do that the that, um, Auditor General comes out with. And so even for us to deal with this issue of corruption in the public sector, one of the incentives that is causing it in recent times, is the 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 uh, uh, ex gratia thing that public servants see, you know, politicians taking home, and so to deal with that issue of corruption, then we also need to find a lasting solution, an emphatic solution to this as Article 71 of this world as ex gratia issue. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Justice. Justice is calling these payments an immoral quantum of money. Uh, let me just find out if uh, our political analyst thinks the same. Uh, are you there? Yes, uh, I'm here. Yes. Well, what do you make of, of these payments? And uh, are they in any way connected to uh, corrupt activities in the public service? Well, um, that would be uh, difficult to, mm. to justify. Mm. But uh, I will say that in, in the perspective of uh, wanting to have your pound of flesh, as it were, it's like uh, 
a kind of revenge on the part of members of the lower class, mm -hmm. you know, on, 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 on state coffers. I think if that is the angle my, my, my colleague is taking it from, then it's probably the case. But uh, let's look at the issue uh, that uh, the former president put across. I think what uh, he has been in that office before, and if you look at the situation that we find ourselves, our financial situation, we are in a dire strait, no two ways about that. So we will need that kind of leadership, as it were, that will cut down on expenditure, senseless expenditure, if I may use that expression. Mm. And if you have that, I think I will, I will, I will rather you know, side with the ex-president on that particular call. Not because I do not enjoy Article 71. But let's look at the issues. Um, why should a Supreme Court judge, for example, who retires on his salary, be given as gracia? Hmm. He has been in office permanently till he retired. Why should he have ex gratia? Now, the, mind, the, the idea that came to mind was that probably because we have three main arms of government, so to speak. You have the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. So if these, three, if these two categories, the executive and the legislature, are taking this kind of money, then obviously they being the third arm of government, then they will also have to qualify for that. But maybe the proposition from the ex-president in terms of the revision that is calling, maybe they will have to look at the integrity and come up with the various details because we have quite a sizable number of people who take the ex in this country, occupying certain offices. And even when we call on them to ensure that the right things are done, you don't really, really get the right responses. The, electoral co the, the commissioners of the electoral commission, they get ex -gratia. Do you even know that there are presidential staffers, presidential staffers that are on ex -gratia? for example, I've mentioned the, the, the judiciary, mm. you know, and so on and so forth. Now, if you're looking at the review, you see, the position of a parliamentarian is not cast in stone. The parliamentarian can lose the seat the very first term that he goes to parliament. Mm. Mm. And, and you could see that the way and manner such a person came to parliament, the money that they might have expended along the line, and then a continual expenditure within the four years on his constituents and the constituency as a whole, you will see that I think this is more justified. But if it is a matter of revision, a revision that should be done downwards, well, I think that is all fair. But I've also listened to parliamentarians on this particular question. And they say that, for example, members of the eighth parliament, they are their condition of service has not been determined yet. So now, as we speak, they are taking the salary of the seventh parliament. And so in their case, their argument is that it is when they are exited, probably that is when their new condition of service would have come. And that is why they will have to collect that money from the time that they entered parliament. And it is called as gracia. And for them, that is a nomenclature that has gone wrong. Hmm. But you will see that, all in all, I think we will need the Auditor General to, as a matter of agency, let us know how much the state pays or expends when it comes to S. Gracia. It should be isolated in the audit report, so that then becomes something that we can all grapple with. And then we need to know the full list, the full list of those who qualify and those probably who are giving it up, who are giving uh, like a dollar kind of money, you know, by the executive and so on and so forth, so that we can look at the constitutional provision and ensure that the country does not continuously hemorrhage. Right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Santiotri. I'm just going to uh, quickly move on to the cost of a living crisis. Now, uh, we, we know that. Uh, Ghanaians have been asked to brace themselves for more hardships because inflation for August has increased again to 
over 33%. Uh, there's also been an announcement about increase in transport fares. There's been an announcement about increase in water uh, that is sold, such as water and bottled water. Uh, are we seeing enough effort to mitigate this cost of living crisis and can it even get any worse than it presently is? How do how will we survive a worse situation? Let me check on uh, Lordia Nunu uh, if if she's on the line. Uh, Lordia, hello, Lordia, are you there? Yes, I hear you. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Before we move on to that, if you could just weigh in on this uh, whole egg squasher issue before we move on. Okay, so um, I do agree with, um, I don't remember the name, though. Not, not just it, the other speaker calling for the publication of all those who benefit from the egg pressure. I agree with him, and I also believe that uh, they should also add um, they are, the kind of benefits they get when they are in power, so that we know that when they are in power, or when they are in office, these are the things they get. If it's even possible, let's say for those who are in a permanent work, but they qualify to benefit from the air pressure, can we reduce some of their allowances, make their salary rather huge, so that when they go on from pension, they will be able to get enough from their pension benefits. That way, we wouldn't have to be paying them such huge air pressures. And then I think that can also help us in saving some money for the country. Other than that, they're all workers, all government workers. There are people who work for 40 years, 30 years, and then when they are going home, they receive, I mean, something that you cannot mention. Mm -hmm. Then other than that, we all deserve some. So maybe the salaries must rather be good so that when we go on pension, our pension will be so good that we do not need extra money to survive the system. Right. So that's my yeah. take on the air Right. Let us move on to uh, the cost of living crisis uh, that we're dealing with. Can it get any worse? And if it does, how do we survive? Yeah, um, of course. Of course, we have to prepare for it getting worse, especially when we are getting so much Christmas. Because uh, mm. we all know that normally during the festivity period, the prices of things increase. And the one thing that I've also noticed is that in Ghana, prices only increase. They never come down. So as the prices are increasing, even if in the, uh, on the world market the prices reduce, we know that our own will not reduce. So the only thing we can do as people is that um, let us prepare for the worst. If you prepare for the worst and then it becomes better, you can survive. If you prepare for the worst and it still becomes worse, that one too, at least you can survive. But uh, the issue of water, I think that water is a necessity. It's a basic necessity that everybody needs. Mm. So there must be, I don't know whether government can find ways and means of making sure that the prices of water should not overly be that high. Because it means that the moment it happens like that, we are preventing the poor from getting quality water, which also goes against the SDGs. How mm. can we help so that, I mean, when a school child who is in a public school can easily walk and they buy water to drink, maybe we have to find ways and means to reduce the price. But they buy such a one such a water for 50 pesos, it's, it's, it's mm. too much. Right. It's too much. Right. But, Thank uh, you, Lordia. Mm, all, all in all, we, we are expecting the prices to go higher. And Thank then you. we can also change some of our lifestyle a little so that we will help to save some money. Hey, thank you, Lord. Yeah. As for lifestyle, we've been making adjustments for over a year now. I don't know how far <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how far people can go. But let's move on to Aisha One. Uh, there's no one more popular than Aisha One in Ghana right now. And we know that she is has come to be known as a Chinese Galamsey Queen. She was in court this week, was denied bail. Um, after pleas by her lawyer, Captain Krabi Ifadate, who's also been granting some interviews. Uh, the lawyer, after those court proceedings, interacted with some journalists. And let's just take a listen to some of the things that he said. I think it was a wrong move, but they took her out of Ghana. Today we are being told in the court that she sneaked 
out of Ghana, which is false, a blatant untruth, an inaccurate statement, which was made to the court. Very sad, most unfortunate. My worry is that the media has overhyped this small matter of mining without license and uh, doing mineral sales without license. It's a small matter. It happens every day in Ghana. So I don't see why the media should even write an editorial on this matter. And it is that which is creating a problem and giving all manner of, uh, all manner of insecurity to the issue. Hey, media, media for your burger now. But, well, uh, let's move on to the discussion. Uh, if you listen to Asha Wan's lawyer, he says the media has blown a small issue of mining without license out of proportion. I have no idea how uh, a foreign national in Ghana mining without license was arrested, managed to slip uh, away without the repercussions applying to her, finds her way back into the country, continues with the very crime for which she was first arrested. And we say it's a small matter and blame the media for blowing it out of proportion. It seems uh, we have issues with the media when their work does not favor us or works against us. We're the same people who ask the Ghanaian media to be up and doing. Let me come to you uh, first, Justice. Um, since this, this concerns the media. Okay, I, th I think I don't have you on the line uh, right now, so l let me just go to Laudia, since she's also a journalist. Laudia, is, yes. uh, uh, is a journalist the problem over here? How did we get to that point? <laughs> journalists are, are, are not the problem. But, I mean, journalists are supposed to also speak for the, the vulnerable. Right. And in this case, I would say that we are all vulnerable when it comes to galamte because of the effects that comes with it. Now, I may not be at the uh, galamte area, neither do you. But the issue is, we are talking about water. We just spoke about the prices of water. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And experts have told us that if we do not fight this issue of galamte very well, very soon we'll be importing water. Mm. So in in effect, water, which is a basic need, it affects all of us. You understand? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So why would I sit down and wait for the things to destroy before I talk about it? Two, it will also affect agriculture. Those of us in Accra, we all take our food from the interland. And if our people there cannot farm because of Galamse, definitely there could be uh, food insecurity. And when there is food shortage, prices will still go up. And it will also affect us, whether you are a journalist, you are a politician, you are whatever. So we need to protect some of these things. It also has some health implications because of the mercury that they are using. Are we going to sit down and then wait for all these things to happen? And the money that are supposed to be channeled into development would then be channeled into solving some of these issues, like the health implications that those living there will have. I think as journalists, we, we don't only report. But there are issues that we also need to analyze. We need to bring to the fore. Sometimes people do not really understand the in and out of the issues. It takes the journalists to bring them out for the public to really appreciate what is happening. Because somebody will sit somewhere, just like the, the lawyer said. As for the lawyer, understanding is defending his client. Mm -hmm. So he said this small matter. But it is more than a small matter when you do proper analysis of it. So if such a person is telling the public that it's a small matter, can you imagine if there, there are no journalists to actually bring the issues out? We will all say it is a small matter. At the, at the end of the day, before we realize we are facing the effect of this galaxy. So I think it is now. We need to talk about it now. And then tackle it right from the root. So for me as a journalist, I don't see that we are doing anything wrong. We need to talk and we will continue talking. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Laudia. Let me just move on to Mr. Autry, who's still on the line. Uh, Mr. Autry, if you listened to the president in 2018 concerning this particular uh, issue, he, he mentioned that the deportation of Aisha Wan 
uh, was a mistake. In fact, the last time we tweeted this, I, I, I mentioned that this is a, a fantastic opportunity for that mistake to be corrected. But uh, the president now in 2022 is saying that he isn't sure Aisha Wan was indeed deported. What is going on here? Are we seeing any, any real effort at correcting uh, what went wrong? Well, uh, let me say that with respect to this Ghana we say minutes, um, I think Ghana has gone to sleep for quite a long period. Um, Ghana said did not start now. It's been, it's been with us for years. But we never saw the, the water bodies getting destroyed in the way it is getting destroyed today. Sometimes I sit there and I ask myself, if these Chinese had seen this gold thing in this part of the world early enough, even in the colonial period, I wonder if we would not have been located, we would not have been asked to move to a different you know, country as it were. The, the rapacious nature of the Chinese, I don't, I, uh, I wonder why people really entertain that. I don't want to sound racist, but even in their own ordinary work that they do, some kind of employment that they have created in this system, if you go there and find out the kind of treatment they made out to ordinary Ghanaians, you see, we would, there wouldn't be the need to entertain such category of people into this country. I don't want to sound a little harsh, but I think that we need to call it speed and speed and not a small spoon. Look, the Ghana Water Company has threatened that the level of what they call it, GNTU or GNT something, I've forgotten the name, the percentage, if it goes to a certain le a limit, they will not be able to supply water because the cyanide level is just mm -hmm. too high. They will need more chemical to treat that, and that comes at a huge cost. Today, as you said, as part of, you know, our cost of living, you know, we are going to pay more in September in terms of tariffs for electricity and water, as it were. With respect to, you know, Aisha Wan, as you rightly pointed out, I think she's just a microcosm or she's just a tip of the iceberg. We have politicians inside that whole operation and it is becoming so entrenched that they seem to forget that when the water is destroyed, it will affect not only MPP, not only NDC, it will affect all of us. And water, they say, is life. Let me even chip in something, for example. You see that even the gold companies that we have in this country, uh, the mining companies manned by foreigners, so to speak, there is even one currently at Wasako, it's Golden Star or something. Uh, the Mining Act, always ensures that we are supposed to have some kind of local content. It appears the new Chinese, the, some new Chinese management have taken over that particular place. <coughs> and they are taking over all these things against the law. And so as I speak with you, the NIB, National Security, they are about to investigate something of that sort. But that is just by the by. You see, with, with the president, uh, I don't know whether it is old age, that is making him forget issues that he himself made pronouncement on. And you yourself categorically said that, you know, it was, it was an error on the part of government to have let the woman go. Because then it means that for you, she ought to have been prosecuted. What that means is that the woman is no longer in our jurisdiction. How then do you in some subsequent years come and tell us that you don't even know whether. So who is not telling the president the right thing? Or as some people are trying to hold brief for the president, he might have misspoken. I think that as a commander in chief of, of, of the Ghana Armed Forces, uh, being at the helm of affairs in terms of national security and so on and so forth, when you speak, it holds a lot of water. Mm. So the security of the nation is in your hands. Mm. We need to and sure that we are in the right hands. Right. As it stands now, I think age is not on the side of the president, right. and we are all suffering for it.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Ochri. Uh, if you just give me your last remarks in uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, Mr. Ochri. As a set of hands, I, I expected Dr. Baumier and Co. to give us some three, six, six months interim kind of uh, policy that will ensure that we have some kind of bumper harvest in the system. Mm -hmm. I have proposed a few things, but it appears we are not handling that. And all what you do is to give yourself excuses and say that IMF, and uh, sorry, you say uh, COVID-19. Now, World Health Organization is saying that we are at the end of COVID-19. I wonder mm -hmm. what kind of excuse that we are going to use again. Maybe the death of Queen Elizabeth is the next excuse for our government for us to be spending so much on Thank food. Thank you so much. When in actual fact, you can see it's that our okay. city is that which is not performing because the price keeps coming down. Thank you, Mr. Ochri, uh, for that submission. Let me just go to Laudia for her last remarks. Laudia, are you on the line? If you can sum up for me in one minute, please. Hello, Laudia. I'm not getting your line, so unfortunately I'm going to take your last submission as your last uh, remarks. Justice, if you're on the line, uh, can you just sum up for me in one minute, please? Hello, Justice. Can you unmute? I can't hear you. Right. Sorry, yes. Right. Thank you very much. Yes, so what I, what I can say is that, yes, I just saw a World Bank um, story earlier today saying that um, the global economy could be going into recession in 2023. As a country, what plans do we have? What levers do we have, you know, to support our people when the global economy goes into recession? Because people are really suffering. The price hikes, like Lodia said earlier, prices never come down. The Ghana pricing system defies, you know, gravity, which says everything that goes up must come down. Ghana's prices, when they go up, they stay up there, they keep increasing, no matter what the um, uh, uh, economic factors are. So there should be a particular system in place to support our people. Right. And if I were in Ghana, this is what I would be thinking about today. Thank you. What Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, one minute up. Thank you. We are completely out of time. So thank you. Uh, Justice Lee is a journalist. We also spoke with Lordia Nunu, who's also a journalist. We spoke with Asante Ochri, a political analyst. We're hoping that in the next few weeks, whatever uh, the news may be about this recession, we are not so hard hit. But we'll be bringing you updates as we go along. My name is Nuong Falong, and this is Spotlight on MX24 Television. We are so grateful for your time. Have a great weekend. Good evening.